In this video, I'm going to introduce context-sensitive grammar, which is more powerful than context-free grammar, and you can see in the rules. So rule one is very basic. It says S goes to ABC or ASBC, but then in rules two and below, we see that they take quite a different form than what we're used to. So we can say that there's now context involved. So for instance, in rule two, we have non-terminal CB goes to non-terminals CZ. So in other words, we're saying that this B to Z transition cannot occur anywhere. It can only occur when it comes after a non-terminal C. So with this, we can now do languages such as A to the N, B to the N, C to the N, which we saw was not possible in context-free languages using the Pumpin lemma. So let's generate A2, B2, C2. Okay, we'll start with S. S is our start symbol. And the first thing we'll do is we'll change S into ASBC. So let's rewrite S as ASBC. And now we're going to use S again, except this time we'll convert it into just ABC. So we'll be left with A, S will change into ABC, and then we're left with BC from before. Okay, so now we have AA, which is what we want. But we have this problem because BC is out of order. So in context-free languages, if we had to pump something, we would have this ordering problem if we wanted to pump all the numbers up equally. But now, using a set of rewrite rules, 2 to 5, we can reorder B and C, or should I say we should reorder really the C and B here, in order to get the right order. So let's do this C and B. Why not? Let's start with this. So really what I should do is I should go left to right. So I should take care of this A, B first with rule number six. So I will start with that first. Let's take A, we'll change this to A, B, and then we'll be left with C, B, C. And now we can start with the non-terminals. Okay, so this CB, what do we do with it first? Well, let's use rule number two and change it to C, Z. So we'll have A, A, B, then we're going to change this to C, Z, and then we're left with C afterwards. Okay, now that we have C, Z, let's use rule number three and change it to W, Z. So now we're left with A, A, B, we have W, Z, and then C as before. So this is pretty incredible. Instead of having Bs and Cs, we now have Ws and Zs, which are totally different variables. But now here's where the magic happens. So let's use rule number four on W, Z, and this will change it to W, C. But what's happening here? Now we have W, sorry, this should be W, C, and we have a C here. So now the Cs are together. So you can imagine what that W is gonna become. In fact, if we take a look at rule number five, we have WC going to BC. So we'll have AAB, then we will have BC, and then C remains. So using these context sensitive rules through a series of substitutions of variables, we're able to switch the C's and B's around in order to get the correct order. And now we just use rules eight, nine, and 10 in order to turn the rest into terminals. So I will do this step by step, but at this part, it's uh, really quite straightforward. So first we do it on BB and change it to both terminals BB. Next we target terminal B, non-terminal C and change them both into terminals. And then finally we target the non-terminal C and terminal C and change them both into terminals using rule number 10. So we have now generated A2, B2, C2. Of course, it's a little bit more difficult to figure out how you even generate the rules to get this in the first place. That is no easy task, but the point is that it's doable. We can now do A2, B2, C2, or more generally A and B and C and with context sensitive grammar. So here's the formal definition. A context-sensitive grammar consists of a four-tuple. 
N, which is non-terminals. Of course, these are just going to be our capital letters like before. Sigma, our set of terminals. So lowercase letters, A, B, C, and so on. P, production rules. And we'll see the format of them before. Essentially, we're going to have alpha, A, beta going to alpha, gamma, beta. And we'll have restrictions on alpha, beta, which we'll talk about in just a second. And then we have S in the set of non-terminals, which is a start symbol. So just like before, I'm going to pick S as the default start symbol. So let's talk about the production rules more specifically. So I said alpha A beta goes to alpha gamma beta. So it's important that the meat of what we're changing in every rule is the non-terminal symbol going to some string gamma. Okay, so this is important. Uh, so alpha and beta have to be in the set of terminals and non-terminal star, which means that alpha and beta can both be empty. So we can get rules of the form A goes to W just like before. So we can get all of our context-free rules within this system. But there, of course, is restraints with having our context here. So gamma cannot be empty. In other words, we can't have something like alpha A beta just going to alpha beta. So we can't just delete A. It has to consist of something. So that's our limitations. And another thing, which probably came up in your minds right away, why couldn't we just do, sorry, let's go CB to BC. So why can't we do that? Well, this would violate our restriction. So we have to pick one of these. So in our form alpha A beta, one of these has to be A. So let's say that this beta, or this, sorry, this capital B is A. Then this means that C is alpha. But if C is alpha in our output, then that means that whatever string came out on the right side, which would be gamma, would have to fill this position. We can't have gamma before alpha. And suppose that alpha actually changed into gamma, which was C, then this B would be our alpha, which has to be the same, but these do not match. So a rule like CB to BC is not acceptable in the system. So it's not that we can do whatever we want. It's that we can rewrite a certain non-terminal given some context, but the context has to stay the same. In fact, where else in linguistics do we see these rules? Well, let's, let's actually outline something like this. We're trying to think of something that we've seen before, such as nasal place assimilation. So let's say we have some nasal N, and then we say it picks up alpha place. I'm being very general here, given that whatever comes after the position has whatever place value. So this plus cons, alpha place, meaning that if we have, say, n, and after the n comes a k, then n will become m. So we get something like ink. And these are just context-sensitive rules. What it's saying is that if we have n and then some place feature here, it just transforms into m, and then the place is the same for whatever consonant here. So let's call this k. So in other words, another way to write this would be nk goes to nk. In this case, we have a being a terminal, gamma. We have an empty alpha position on both sides, but our beta is still the same. So these early phonology rules you've learned, it's just an application of context-sensitive grammar, which is kind of cool. In fact, nobody's ever going to tell you that until you read one of these books, or at least learn some mathematical linguistics. And even then, it's not heavily used in phonology, it's more used in syntax. So this is one of those hidden things that you're probably not taught during your curriculum, that's kind of cool to see. Okay, enough about that. Let's get to the main point here. All context-free languages are context-sensitive, but that's not the same the other way. In other words, 
these alphas and betas can be empty and we can just be left with rules of the form a goes to gamma which we can just rewrite as w as a string so there is this hierarchy called of course the chomsky hierarchy i haven't written everything here if you go to wikipedia and i am recommending wikipedia for the chomsky hierarchy you will see about 15 or so different types of languages and you'll see how they are in terms of power regular is very weak context free is stronger context sensitive is even stronger there is one further level which would be turing machine equivalent which is just way too powerful for human language because you can do whatever you want in fact even context sensitive might be a little bit too powerful for instance what can context sensitive languages do that context free can't well, context-free grammars can't make a distinction between center embedding and cross serial dependencies, but context-sensitive grammars can. So that's a good thing. So what does center embedding look like? Center embedding is when you have an equal number of NPs, an equal number of Vs, and they link according to outsides go together and then it moves in. So NP1 goes with V1, which is at the end, NP2 goes with V2, which is at the second end, and NP3, V3. So there's this kind of center embedding. So a sentence like the dog, the cat, the mouse chased, hit, ran away. Very difficult to understand. Cross seal dependencies, mainly demonstrated in German, but also do appear in English, uh, work a little bit differently. So they have different crossing structures. Again, NP1 links with V1, which are equal distance apart. NP2 with V2, equal distance apart. NP3, V3, equal distance apart. So although context-free languages can generate NP to the N, V to the N languages, both of these are of the form NP to the N, V to the N, but they have different structures. And context-sensitive languages can get us to those structures. So in other words, context-free is too weak. Context-sensitive seems, to seems to be about where we should be. But the question is, is it too powerful? And maybe there's a grammar that's a little bit less powerful than a context-sensitive grammar, but can generate exactly enough that we need for the English language and other languages as well. Because a system that's too powerful, there's no point because it can explain everything, right? But if a system is too weak, there's things that can't be explained. So we want this middle ground where we have a system that is just enough to explain everything that happens in language, but doesn't overgenerate. So in the next video, I will introduce tree adjoining grammar, which will look very similar to the syntax you've seen before and deals with some phenomena in syntax such as islands very, very nicely. So if you have any questions, please leave them in the comments below and I'll answer them the best that I can.